Hi everyone, welcome to the new episode of The Prime New, series of interviews with top business and technology leaders. Recently I had the pleasure to interview Duncan Epping, chief technologist at VMware and a person who is often referred to as a legend of the company. Duncan is a prolific writer who wrote eight books on VMware's technologies. He is often guest of different podcasts and shows, and he is founder of yellowbrick.com blog. In the interview, we talked about many things. Among those are VMware solutions for Kubernetes, the future trends of, in hyperconverged infrastructure. We talked about the interesting topic of VMware's acquisitions and how company organizes work on products and features for highly distributed teams. It's a great interview, and I believe you will find it very insightful. And if you do, please don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues who will also benefit from it. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel not to miss the next great interviews coming your way. You've been uh, in VMware for quite a few years now. You've been uh, working with many technology products. What is the most interesting tech for you personally and where do you see the largest potential? Sure, yeah, that's an interesting question. So for those who don't know, I, I may, you know, maybe wise to give some background on me personally as well, I know you already did an introduction, but let me give some additional uh, information. So right now I work as a chief technologist in the cloud platform business unit. Uh, before that, I was uh, mainly focused on storage specifically for the past probably six, seven years or so. And before that, I actually was a consultant and uh, worked at many large enterprise companies and was responsible for the architecture and, and, and the configuration and stuff like that around vSphere uh, specifically. And, you know, long, long before that, I actually did a lot around the, uh, what in the Microsoft space. Now, as a result, you can imagine that my focus for the past, you know, probably two decades or so has primarily been uh, enterprise uh, IT, and I think, you know, a lot of interesting things are happening in enterprise uh, IT right now. We're seeing a couple of clear trends, right? And those trends have been happening for the past couple of years. I think, you know, people have been talking about Kubernetes and containers for a while now, but what we are starting to see is that now a lot of enterprise organizations are starting to adopt it. They're actively uh, looking into how they can, you know, move from traditional platforms to these more cloud native platforms. Of course, that comes with a lot of challenges because a lot of the applications that they have running are legacy applications. They were never really built uh, for that, you know, cloud native space. So as a result, they also need to refactor a lot of those applications. That's where the complexity comes into play. Because as you can imagine, in a lot of cases, you know, they have these applications maybe running for 10, 15 years, some, some cases even longer than that, right? So chances of them actually having the expertise in-house people in-house who still fully understand how that whole st stack works, why it works in a particular <laughs> way, what the connections are, are quite slim. So I think that is probably not from a technology perspective, the most interesting thing that is happening, but more from a people culture, you know, learning process development, uh, you know, that is probably the most interesting thing that is happening right now, because everyone's trying to figure out, you know, how were these things constructed? How can I move them to a newer platform? What are the benefits of that newer platform, right? Should I even be moving it? And if it moves, you know, what does it actually bring to the company? Because that is the other questions that question that you need to ask first. The other thing, which I think is interesting from a technology, which is happening, is the whole uh, AI ML space, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And, you know, I think there's a lot of different things happening and uh, many people, again, are still figuring out what they could do with it, um, you know, what it could bring to them as a, as a company or, you know, as part of a part of a company. And, you know, as a result, you will see that, for instance, from a VMware perspective for the past, probably four or five years, uh, we focused a lot on not only the cloud native workloads, but also AI and ML and how we can enable, enable those types of workloads on top of our platform while partnering with, you know, larger vendors out there that provides, uh, that provide technology uh, that would cater for these workloads. So for AI and ML, that would, of course, be, you know, companies like NVIDIA who have that GPU offering or AMD or Intel, of course. And we work closely with them. For me personally, I think um, 
AI and ML, ML is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And that's mainly because of my storage background, because what you will see with artificial intelligence or machine, machine learning is that what people will end up doing is they will try to run these algorithms against the data set. Now, of course, the data set that needs to be stored somewhere and it also probably needs to move from storage into memory to do something with it. And that's, that is one of those interesting things because the challenges that people will hit is that they will have these massive data sets that somehow need to move from, from A to B. And that is, you know, rather complex. As you can imagine, in the majority of cases, the, uh, the infrastructure that people have available may not be suitable uh, to run those types of workloads or, you know, move those massive amounts of, of, of data around. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things happening right now. I think it's an, uh, an interesting time when it comes to uh, IT. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, so specifically, this is something very interesting, Duncan, that you touched on, right? That there are lots of companies that actually want to transform their businesses, right? They But they don't see how actually to do that, right? But what I could see from VMware, you have a like huge array of products and solutions, right? Um, offering to different clients, like you have tons of services, VMware cloud, you have hybrid cloud and hyper converged infrastructure and many more. So how do you specifically advise your potential clients? What is the best option for them? Do you have like huge number of business analytics? So what is the process like? Yeah, I think it all starts with, uh, you know, the traditional account management. I think that is one of those things that we as a company uh, do extremely well. Uh, of course, we have a sales team, we have a pre-sales team, we have consultants, we have architects, we have business uh, analysts, uh, we have data scientists, you name it, right? The most important thing always starts with having a conversation with the customer. I think that's where it basically starts. You need to figure out what they are doing now and which direction they want to head into and how they are planning to maneuver to that towards that direction, right? Is, you know, us, are we as a company still part of that that? path and how we can we guide them to the best best solution i think that is first of all the most interesting or first of all the problem that you should solve and having said that that's also the most interesting thing about my role because i work as a technologist uh, which basically means i have no sales quota or anything like that right and of course when i talk to a customer i would prefer them to use vm technology but you know, if they have, you know, let's say they use our virtualization platform and I'm talking to them about our storage platform, our hyper offering that we have as well, but they are, as a customer don't have the requirements or have different requirements that would lead them into a different direction. I'm fully happy to have that conversation with them. You know, my focus is always to make sure that we have a happy customer, right? You can sell them all the products they want, but if they are not using the, those products, you can bet that the next time they will need to renew they will think about replacing you. So the first thing is always to ensure that you have a happy customer, figure out what their requirements are, what the design, what they desire to do, and then try to focus on, okay, where does that actually fit? Do they want to have their equipment on premises for whatever reason, or, you know, are they potentially looking into adopting several uh, public clouds? And if they are, you know, potentially moving to the public cloud, could they, you know, do a combination of public cloud, private cloud, or mm -hmm. could they do a combination of public cloud, for instance, native AWS and VMware cloud on AWS, right? Which potentially sits in the same same data center and you would have all of those benefits. So to me, it's always the you know, most important to have the discussion with the customer first, figure out what it is that they are doing, figure out which direction they want to head into. So create a roadmap uh, from a business perspective and then try to figure out how you can align different technologies to ensure that they can meet their uh, uh, business business goals, because that's essentially why they run the, their IT platforms, right? They, they run their IT platforms because they want to meet particular business goals. They're not running it just so they can say we have you know 50 computers running. It's that's you know yeah. it needs to serve a purpose. Absolutely, yeah, totally agree with you. So it's first. Uh just technical need right to serve their business need this is not just the aim in itself right to run the computers or run the the cloud okay great answer thank you duncan about, about that so next is about managed kubernetes cluster it's a hot topic in the last few years and all clouds we know all clouds now are offering such capabilities and i would be specifically interested what are the benefits of vmware solution for Kubernetes clusters? Well, I think, it's, first of all, 
the most important aspect of the solution that we offer is simplicity. And I think anyone who's done anything with Kubernetes or containers in general um, probably figured out within the first few minutes that is that it's extremely complex and not just to install and configure, mm -hmm. but more importantly to manage, right? And that's where I think our solution comes into play. And that's probably what I think our solution does best, if, especially if compared to all of the other solutions out there. Uh, and especially for those customers who want to run, you know, it either on-premises, so in the private data center, or potentially, you know, do a combination of on-premises with public cloud environments, potentially even multiple different public clouds offerings. I think that is one of those, those things that we have focused on from day one, is the ability for customers not only to have their workloads running within their own data center, but potentially even manage those clusters that are in the public cloud as well. Create that hybrid cloud experience where potentially, you know, applications, you know, could be cross-connected between those clouds or, you know, could move between those, those, those clouds potentially as well, or, you know, and any of those combinations that you would desire. And of course, the thing with us is, as I've already mentioned, simplicity is key. So we will take care of the, you know, installation, configuration aspects of things, the upgrades, the updates, and what have you. And I think that those are things that are extremely important for customers. And we, we've seen this happening, right? We've seen this happen with various types of platforms uh, before. OpenStack is, is the name that I wanted to mention. So with OpenStack, for instance, a lot of people jumped right into it. And we've seen the same with Kubernetes as well. So people are like, oh, OpenStack is this new great platform. You can do anything you want with it. Well, that's also where the problem comes into play. play. Because when it provides an insane amount of possibilities, that typically also introduces a lot of co complexity. And what we've seen with customers that were successful, for instance, with OpenStack, is they were extremely successful with OpenStack because they had hundreds of engineers managing those systems. But the reality is the majority of companies out there, enterprise organizations, are not in the business of managing IT systems. They are in the business of you know, selling products or services, right? And the, the IT is just a service they are providing to their business owners. So. In that potential, in, in those cases, they typically don't want to have hundreds of engineers running around managing a particular stack. They would prefer to have a solution that is easy to manage, easy to configure, easy to install, easy to update. And that's where typically VMware comes in, into play. I think that's truly the strength of our platform. And as, as some of the folks watching this or listening to this may know, our offering actually runs on top of our hypervisor, on top of our virtualization uh, platform. It's fully integrated. So not only can you run these newer type of workloads uh, uh, on, on our platform, you can still have your legacy workload sitting next to it as well. So you don't need to create a fully new separate environment next to it, which is only dedicated to those cloud native apps. You can actually share those, 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 those platforms for those different types of applications. So not only does that make it easy to deploy, easy to manage, it's also efficient from a cost perspective. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, as we do this across cl clouds, it also provides a lot of flexibility. Yeah, maybe you could, that, that's very interesting, the simplicity and flexibility, right? That's something that lots of companies would appreciate, highly appreciate that, right? So uh, that is not the question that was on the list, well, yeah. So maybe you could provide a case study, right? Or a case of implementation, one of your solutions, right? To a customer, if you can name a customer or maybe some more generic uh, case study where a customer had the need and you helped them implement uh, your solution, if that is possible. Yeah, can... one of the case studies that could be interesting from an AI ML perspective where Kubernetes also came into play is VMware did a lot of work with a cancer research uh, institute in uh, in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And uh, that solution actually all revolves all around uh, Kubernetes, containers, AI, and ML. Plus, they heavily leaned on our hyperconverged platform to actually create that infrastructure layer underneath across multiple locations to also provide availability at the same time. That was an, a very interesting use case uh, from my point of view uh, because of what, what they were doing specifically uh, for that infrastructure, with that infrastructure. So with that infrastructure, just to explain what it um, what it was doing, that infrastructure is actually used by um, hospital workers during the day as a VDI platform, so a virtual desktop platform. But when these folks, you know, go home, go, go home, what they actually end up doing with that platform is they leverage as an, uh, uh, lever they leverage the platform as an AI and ML platform because they already have a lot of uh, GPU 
capacity mm -hmm. within that platform. Uh, they can leverage the, the GPU capacity and then do machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence with that platform as well. So they share that platform for these two purposes, which I thought was brilliant because otherwise, you know, that platform would just sit there unused for 12 hours or whatever it ends up being, or, you know, for 90% unused because there's people around at night as well, but not as many as mm -hmm. during the day. So they had that dual purpose, um, the dual purpose setup, which I thought was very interesting. Plus, on top of that, of course, they do great things for the world, trying to cure or trying to find a cure for, for, for cancer, which is, you know, probably one of the best things we, we could do. So that was a very interesting use case. Great example. Thank you so much for sharing that, Duncan. That's really no interesting. Yeah. OK, uh, something that you are a specialist in and expert in, right, is in so networking and storage virtualizations are part of hyper convergence infrastructure. Yes. So what can you foresee in that uh, area? Yes. What new trends can you see being an expert in that domain? Yeah, that's a very interesting um, uh, conversation to have right now, especially because we're starting to see new technologies being implemented. So, for instance, from a networking uh, perspective, one of the things that we are starting to see right now uh, is the, the changes from a, um, a performance point of view. Uh, in the past, right, when we had like three, four years ago, when we had discussions with our customers around the networking speed, for instance, one of the challenges that they had was that the price of these highest speed configurations was relatively high. So a lot of customers were challenged in terms of what they could implement. Uh, but what we're now starting to see is that, you know, the cost has significantly decreased. So we, we're starting to see customers, you know, deploying configurations with 25 gig NICs, 40 gig, 50 gigs, 100 gigs. Uh, we're starting to see customers leveraging uh, RDMA, remote direct memory access uh, technology, which basically gives a lower latency connection between hosts, which will then, of course, also allow us to start moving data around faster. So that will open up a lot more opportunities from a storage point of view. And it will also allow us to use these newer, faster storage devices that are out there a bit more efficient as well. Because so far, what we've seen is that it's been a constant race, right? We had an extremely fast storage device, but the network wasn't fast enough. Then the network became faster. So that allows us to also start using that storage device more efficiently and actually start uh, um, reaching the levels of performance that the storage device was capable of delivering but we couldn't just use yet because the network wasn't there yet. So all of these different things are happening uh, at the same time. If you look at us, uh, for instance, um, and I think the same applies to, to some of our competitors or colleagues out there as well. What we have started to see is that the focus for the longest time was on the storage platform. And then, you know, some of the additional data services that were laying on top, things like replications, threats clustering, uh, deduplication and compression. But now what more and more platforms are starting to deliver is these more data types of or data services where you know, for instance if we give an example which is more related to vmware uh, our solution is called vmware vsan and with vsan for instance we also have what we call a data persistence platform and that data persistence platform is basically a framework that was created for partners so it basically allows partners to run their applications directly on top of, of, of vSAN in a fully automated fashion. So if you're one of those customers, for instance, that would like to deploy a, uh, an S3 object storage uh, based solution on top of vSAN, we actually have a plugin for that. So you go to the vSAN UI and you say, okay, I want to deploy you know, this type of S3 solution on top of vSAN. Normally, you will need to go to the website, download the solution, install it, configure it, try to figure out if it works. Then when you need to update, you need to go through the whole process again. But what we've actually done is we work close with partners. And by working closely with those partners and providing them that framework, they can now offer a solution which runs directly on top of our platform is not only you know easy to install, but also easy to update and easy to manage. So we've created that full integration. And I think that is something that we are starting to see more and more, right? Back in the days when we, we did storage at first, we, we saw things like Fiber Channel, iSCSI, and then you know we had file services with SMB and NFS. Now, of course, we also have S3, and there are also, of course, other types of solutions that could run on the platform like this, for instance, you know, Cassandra databases or, you know, something like Kafka or whatever it could be that is needed from a cloud native perspective. So 
I think from a hyperconverged platform, um, a lot of vendors will move towards that where they will actually start offering these, you know, application services directly as part of the experience. Just not only, you know, well, I, I guess primarily to make life easier for the administrator, right? Because in the end, the administrator is responsible typically for, you know, installing and configuring, right? If we can make that easier for our customers, then, you know, you make the platform sticky as well. So it's, you know, there's a, it's a win-win uh, situation for both us as the vendor, as well as the, the customer. Yeah, and actually, you know, this is something that, um, you know, like, um, again, uh, stresses your point that your solution, they are, they are simple, right? They are simplifying the life for your clients and they are also flexible. And this with the, the example you have just provided is actually something that, um, that helps to understand this even better. Before the interview, I've done the research and it was like, wow, the huge portfolio of products and many uh, solutions. And what I could see that many of these products and solutions, uh, some of them are result of acquisitions. And I'm like, you said that you are not the part of sales team or pre-sales or engagement, but maybe you know, what, how does your company chooses the um, targets for acquisitions? Sure, yeah, that is always an interesting uh, uh, process. Not too long ago, we um, acquired a company, uh, Datrium, which is part of our business business unit. So that may probably be the best example. And one of the reasons for us to uh, acquire um, that that company in particular is is because we noticed that uh, amongst our customers, a lot of customers were looking for a solution where they could replicate data uh, easily to a you know a cheap target cloud storage of some kind but that not only replicate the data, but also have the ability to recover uh, from that, uh, 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 you know, replicated data. Now, th this is not an easy problem to solve. So what we typically do as a company is, first of all, is it something that we can develop ourselves? Now, then of course you need to figure out, okay, you know, what are the number of hours involved? What would be the size of the project? What is the cost involved with a project like, like, like that? And of course, you know, depending on the cost, depending on the, the amount of time that it would take to complete that project, is there a potential way to get that IP, to get that solution mm -hmm. on board without actually having to make that, you know, potentially, you know, multiple years of development time investment, right? And especially when there's a need to go to market fast, that's typically where the acquisition comes into play. In some cases, well, you may come up with a solution or you see something happening in the industry. There's a particular trend that you know you have at least three to five years before people are actually moving into the direction. Well, if that is the case, you can decide to develop it yourself. In some cases, you know, some of these trends uh, come up extremely fast, right? When COVID occurred, for instance, you know, the whole world all of a sudden shifted from working in an office to working at home. So. That, that's also, you know, one of those situations okay. where acquisitions could be very beneficial because it will allow you to offer a solution almost instantly, depending, of course, on the level of integration that needs to occur. And that is something that we've experienced with, for instance, Daytrium as well. They had an offering that allowed us to almost instantly uh, provide a solution for customers. We knew customers had a particular problem. We knew it would take a significant amount of time to solve that problem uh, ourselves. We had the added, added benefit of knowing the, uh, the the people that founded the company, because a lot of them actually came from VMware originally. Mm -hmm. They may have some, you know, stops here and there in between, but we knew that from a cultural perspective, it would be a good fit. Now, then the only thing, of course, you will need to do is figure out, okay, what have they actually built? Uh, what is the quality of what they created? You know, that of course is part of that process as well. As part of the process, engineers will go in and try to figure out, you know, is that actually quality quality code? Uh, is that something that we could integrate, uh, you know, with within a reasonable amount of time? And you know, then as part of that, of course, there's you know, uh, you need to figure out what the cost is going to be of of the acquisition itself, and what type of acquisition is going to be. Are you actually acquiring the full company? Are you acquiring, you know, a subset, a particular product, a particular service that they have? Uh, Will all the engineers be be on board, or all the staff be on board? Will not, will, well, of course, you know, there's a lot of different things that come come into play, and it's a it's a rather complex uh, process as well. I think the one thing that we have done extremely well, if you look at, for instance, 
I think Daytrim is a good example. Uh, we acquired uh, acquired them, and literally within a few months, we had a beta running, and a couple of months later, we had the uh, the GA release. So the integration is is something that we do extremely well, and the whole you know due diligence process is something that I think VMware is good at as well. We have a you know a slew of examples of product offerings, as you noticed during the uh, the research. A lot of uh, the products that we have available right now came in through acquisition, but for a lot of those product products, you wouldn't even notice anymore, right? There's no, there's nothing that actually shows any sign of the fact that it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's acquired. In some cases, you, know, you may, may see it because of the logo that actually, the logo actually states the name and then by VMware, you know, that gives a hint that it was acquired, but in, in most cases you won't see that. So I think that is something that we do uh, extremely, extremely well. And I also think it's really important, right? Because as a company, it's almost impossible to focus on, you know, all of the different things that happen at the same time from an enterprise IT perspective, right? It's, if you look at what we've done so far, our focus is primarily the infrastructure side of things. Then we started looking at the uh, application landscape, but as part of course uh, uh, of the infrastructure and the application landscape, there's also security that uh, aspects that come into play, which we also uh, acquired. Uh, we acquired Nasira, which now is known as NSX, uh, which is our security and and um, and networking offering. Of course, there were other uh, acquisitions as well as well around. Uh, um, security and, and networking just to ensure that we could start offering the services that customers were, were looking for. But integrating those solutions is probably, you know, one of those things what I think, you know, VMware excels. Do you ever take part in that? See whether that offering that you plan to integrate, whether it's worth invested investments? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I report directly into the chief technology officer for our business unit. Uh, so he's involved in every single acquisition, as you can imagine. And uh, depending on the type of company, the company or product or feature that we're looking to acquire in some shape or form, uh, you know, either myself or someone else that is part of the team or, you know, of course, it depends on what we're looking to test, but someone will be involved. Uh, typically, what we will do is that there are a couple of work streams that will run separately. Of course, there's the whole uh, business business side of things, right? What is the cost going to be, and does that actually align with you know the potential uh, additional revenue that we may have in the upcoming you know two to three years, depending on the time time frame that they're looking into. Uh, but one of the other things, of course, that we will do is, as mentioned, engineers will look at the code. People will need to deploy it and, and and configure it, install it, just to figure out if it actually works from a operational perspective. Is this something that would you know, make our customers happy. In some cases, the code may look, you know, great, but the user experience may not be at the level that our customers would expect it to be, right? Well, then we still may need to make the decision to not acquire it, or we need to figure out, you know, what would be the effort to make sure that um, from a user experience perspective is at the level. The other thing, of course, that comes into play is, for instance, when we acquired Datrium, there was also a performance aspect uh, that we had to look at. Uh, they had a storage platform, we're actually replicating data from A to B. They have a file system. Does that actually perform as they, uh, you know, state it performs, right? Those are all different things that comes into play. So for instance, though, before those performance tests, those tests were conducted by members of our team. So depending on uh, what is needed, you know, you may or may not be involved. Of course, the one thing to mention here, I think uh, this is something that, well, probably some of you may, may 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 realize it, but I think a lot of people forget about it. These things are uh, typically, you know, under full NDA. So Absolutely. there's a limited set of people typically involved with these uh, discussions for obvious o obvious reasons, right? Um, if, if news leaks out that VMware is potentially acquiring company A, B, or C, then you know, a couple of things could happen. A you know, it may ramp up the, the ramp up the price. B uh, competitors may get involved in the in the bidding bidding war. So that there's there's all of these different situations. So it's usually a limited set of people that is involved, but it, it would usually include someone that is part of the organization I work in. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Totally understand uh, these points that you have made about the NDA and being not being able to inc include lots of people into the process just to. Uh, preserve the information leak. Okay, ne next thing is about, you know, that you have a, you're a global company and you have diversified teams working across the globe. So I would be interested in how is the development work uh, organized? 
right? Whether you are distributed offices own individual products or global distributed teams are working across your portfolio. Yeah, that that, that is, um, it, it actually depends on the feature on the, on the product that is being worked on. And a part of that is also the acquisition uh, aspect of things. Uh, as you can imagine, in some cases, we acquired products or features that were developed from a single location. So, you know, some, some of those like, you know, products may have been developed in Israel or uh, we have we have literally offices all over the real world, right? But the majority of cases, those offices are sales offices. So they have pre-sales, post-sales uh, and salespeople uh, within those offices. Uh, we have a few uh, actual engineering uh, offices. And in the majority of cases, what you will see is that it fully depends on the product itself. Uh, if you look at the largest product, for instance, vSphere, the majority of the vSphere engineers, so the backend engineers, the people actually working on uh, what, you know, the, the aspect of the feature that you don't see in the UI, a lot of them are actually based out of uh, Palo Alto, uh, but we also have, you know, engineers in China. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, our user interface team, the majority of those are actually based in Bulgaria. Uh, we have some uh, user experience folks based in Bulgaria, uh, but we also have user experience folks based in the US. So it's it's a, it, it's a mix of, of, of those. Uh, typically, what they will try to do is they will try to make sure that folks that work on a particular feature, a feature set or a product to be at least in the same time zone. Um, mostly, you know, folks working on the same feature are located you know, next to each other typically, because it's just easiest to, to work on a particular product. But you can imagine that some products like vSphere, for instance, it's an extremely large product. Well, we wouldn't be able to have have all of those engineers sitting in the same building or sitting in the same same area. So in that particular case, they are actually scattered across, uh, across the globe. But again, uh, you know, for some features, some products, they are located in, 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 in you know, one one building and for others they are not. Maybe a, a nice example is for uh, the, the way we do that with, within our team. So um, before I, we became part of the cloud platform business unit, I was part of the storage uh, business unit. Our primary product was vSAN. Uh, for vSAN, for instance, we have something that we call a health check. The health check is, you know, a capability that actually validates if your environment is running correctly or not. You know, if all of the disks, all of the flash devices, uh, if you're, uh, you know, if they're all running as they should be running, if the network is com correctly configured, what have you. Uh, well, that part of the the system, for instance, the UI, so the user interface was developed in Bulgaria, but the backend system was completely developed in China. Now, the majority of our other engineers are actually based in Palo Alto. So mm -hmm. um, you can imagine that, you know, that there's a lot of interaction happening between these teams, yet the team that is located within that uh, geographic location still owns you know either a feature or potentially even a full product so it depends on the size of the product and you know how they actually if they were acquired or not and or how they grew organically i see it's very interesting you know decision to have the development team in bulgaria i hear like lots of you know that uh, right now i'm in ukraine so there are lots of like outsourcing to ukraine as well but i'm interested yep. why specifically in bulgaria is there you found there are lots of uh, tech talent there or, or if you are aware of the decision what was the decision uh to move your to have this teams in bulgaria yeah, I wasn't. Uh, well, I, I, I wasn't involved with the decision back then. Uh, the decision was made a long, long time ago, okay. and I wasn't part of the the R and D organization uh, at that time. But I think one of the things is definitely uh, the tech talent. Uh, the same applies for a lot of the Eastern European countries. To be fair, um, you know, Bulgaria, as you mentioned, the, the Ukraine. Um, we we see we seen the same thing. For instance, in Israel, for whatever reason, the level of engineers that we were capable of hiring in those locations is just at a completely different level. Of course, the added benefit for a company like VMware is the cost involved as well, right? If you if you compare the cost of an employee in Bulgaria, you compare that to an employee in, in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley, where it's extremely difficult to hire people these days because there are so many large tech companies. Well, you know, that is also one of the reasons, of course, to, to look at the, those regions. But for us, and if you look at the work that I've been doing with the uh, with the teams in Bulgaria, I, I can say that you know one of the things that stands out to me is the amount of talent in those regions. It's uh, 
it's easier to hire hire talent although it's getting more complex because you know we're not the only company of course that figured out that there's a lot of tech talent in 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 europe um it is you know those, those people are just at a in my opinion at a, at a different level but again we've seen the same thing for instance with china uh, we have an engineering team we, we have multiple engineering teams in india we have multiple engineering teams uh, in the uk so you know it's it, it's it, it's across the globe yeah absolutely yeah it's a global organization yeah so you know like you yourself you're a good example right so your organization is primarily if i understand correctly is in palo alto and you are in uh, holland right in the netherlands yes. yeah so tell me um what like as you mentioned there is a tough competition for tech talent what does vmware does to attract more of these tech talent experts on board yeah there's yeah Yeah, oh, that's always a different difficult thing, right? And especially if you look at for instance Palo Alto, um if you look at the the the, the region that where we are located, the where, where the office of is located. If you just drive around, right, you will b- bump into Facebook, uh H- HPE, uh you will have you will see the Google offices. There are so many different offices and I'm not just talking about larger organizations. There's also many different startups where it could potentially be, you know, interesting or beneficial for tech talent to join as well, right? You have companies like for instance when we talk about the infrastructure space, uh Rubrik and Cohesity. There's so many different, you know, tech companies and and startups uh in in Silicon Valley which makes it extremely difficult to attract uh, tech talent. I think one of the things that why people join VMR first of all is the culture i think the the, the, the culture of, of of VMR is great it's just not, it's just a great company to work with uh, just as an example um for instance one of the things that that we do ex- well, which i feel we do well is uh when the pandem- pandem- uh, uh, pandemic started uh, one of the things that VMR did is they introduced a couple of uh, i think it's like four or five additional Uh, days off throughout the years throughout the year for all employees at a particular date so they introduced that just so people would have time to you know connect with their family and 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 what have you uh, one of the other things as well is that they uh, introduced uh, a new benefit with which is a certain amount that you can sp- spend on anything around leisure so if you you know person that likes to do Uh, mountain biking or you like you know gaming or whatever it ends up being you can depending on the country where you live you can spend a certain amount of, of money on that and just expense expense that so i think those are tiny things which actually shows you know that it, it's one of those com- companies that actually thinks about their employees and i think that's extremely important of course diversity and inclusion is is something that uh probably the whole tech industry is really focused on uh, but VM of course specifically uh, we're aiming to hire you know more people from a diverse background but more importantly in my opinion is we're trying to include everyone in the conversation i think that is one of those things that a lot of people tend to forget right you can hire all the people you want but if you don't include them in certain parts of the process then you know you're still you're still missing out on the fact that you hired you know a, a diverse range of, of people so having that uh, as as part of the culture is i think extremely uh, i- important and then last but not least uh, for those who never visited palo alto i think we probably have one of the uh, the most beautiful campuses in 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 that region google google's campus of course is insane is great uh, our campus you know probably you know at a similar level if you just walk around Uh, the way that, that they they've laid out the different buildings the landscaping and you know the famous Viemba turtle uh, pond you know those things are of wow. course great to experience as well but unfortunately i'm based out of the <laughs> netherlands so i don't get to go there too often but uh, hopefully we'll be able to go back uh, soon when the, uh, the the covid situation uh, flies over i see wow but next time in Pal- i'm in palo alto i should make sure to go and uh, see your office there for sure Absolutely. Great. Um and you know the last question. I know that you uh Duncan did you had like your personal reason you mentioned that you like the um culture, company culture, right? There is inclusion into the conversation, diversity in the company. I know that you have had before joining VMware, you had the job offer, you had this t- kind of tough decision. So h- how did you make this decision? Right? Great two great enterprises. So if you could share with uh, our listeners yeah sure I, i mean i was very fortunate to be honest um 
just to give the background background story, uh, I work for a consulting company and I started uh, started blogging. So I started writing a lot about virtualization, and based on that, my name started popping up in various places. And back then, it was actually uh, EMC, which was acquired by Dell, and um, EMC was starting out this virtualization practice. So they wanted to have a lot of people on board that you know understood virtualization well. And the person who actually uh, started that, Chad Sackage, who became the VP and president of, of, of Dell EMC for that particular area, he uh, read a couple of my articles and he actually solved a couple of problems in his own uh, lab based on the articles that I wrote. So he ended up contacting me and he asked me if I wanted to join the company, which I was like, okay, who is this person? Why would the you know VP of you know this and that from EMC contact me, right? I'm just a guy who lives in the Netherlands who wrote a couple of blogs. I, I had no idea what was happening. At the same time, um, VMware was actually looking to expand their whole consultancy team in Europe, and as a result, they needed someone in Euro in in the Netherlands as well. Uh, in particular, they already had a person in the Netherlands, but they wanted to hire a second person. Um, the, the the person that already was working for VMware in the Netherlands, um, yeah, he'd seen some of my articles as well, so he gave my name to uh, the recruitment team. So at the same time, uh, the VMware recruitment team reached out to me. So, you know, I was very fortunate that I had two great companies reaching out to me. Um, I had the ability to join EMC as the first V specialist in Europe. So basically start that virtualization team uh, for Europe. And then the other option was join VMware as a consultant. Now, it was, you know, in, in some shape or form, it was a difficult decision because, you know, EMC is a great company to work for. They weren't acquired by, by Dell just yet. Uh, but, you know, it was one of probably one of the most well-known uh, companies, especially in the storage space, right? And uh, my my background was virtualization and storage. So, but then VMware reached out to me, and I'm like, well, I love VMware technology. I love you know working on software primarily. If I would join EMC, my focus is going to be VMware. If I join VMware, my focus is going to be VMware. So you know, I figured I am going to get as close to the fire as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Plus, the other benefit for me was that for the uh, the Dell EMC or the EMC role. Uh, the travel would be probably, you know, four to five times more uh, than with the VMware role. So I decided to join uh, VMware. In the end, I probably just, you know, still traveled as much as I would have with, with the LMC, but it's not a decision I regret. And primarily because um, I think I had one of those um, career progressions, which is rather unique and, you know, different than most people have, right? You don't see a lot of people who join uh, the company as a consultant and then manage to somehow climb up climb up to a chief technologist level you do see it happening but not when people are not based in the you know in in headquarters i'm based in in europe so that usually makes it more complex i think what helped me a lot is the fact that um i did a lot of blogging so I wrote about a lot, lot of different topics. I noticed a lot of different problems. As a result, I, you know, I started reaching out to engineers. I started reaching out to product managers. People get to know your name. Your name pops up more often. You know, first it's an engineer, then it's the product manager, then it's the director of product management. Before you know, it's the VP of, you know, a particular business unit that sees your name, you know, passing by uh, rarely, frequently. So that's how I was able to. You know, climb the ladder in the in the organization. It's uh, it's a unique thing, and I'm happy I made that that decision. Although I'm pretty sure that I would have really enjoyed, you know, working for EMC or Dell EMC as it's uh, as it is right now as well, because it, that that is also a great company to work for for anyone, in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating story, Dan. Kind of your career and your career progression. So, um, also, I want to thank you for your time and for your insights. And I believe that all of the, the Prime View listeners, they will find it invaluable, your insight and your story. So, thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me.